Right. Again, a uh, hearty welcome to you all, and it's wonderful that more of you are here this week than last week. And I think if there's one thing that the last few months have taught us is that we need each other. Since I'm far enough away from you, I'm now going to take off my mask um, because also I believe as much as possible, we do also need to see each other's faces. It's difficult in the con congregation, obviously, for the reasons of the virus. You will not be able to take off your mask when you're sitting there. I'm far enough away from you, so I'm able to do that. We need community. We need our relationships amongst each other, and we need relationship with God. And last week, we already had this beautiful uh, sculpture here, which you are most welcome after the service to come and have a look at, um, which actually symbolizes that unity. If you, come, if, you, if you look at it later, you will see there are people holding arms like that, and the light of Christ, the light of God in the middle. And that is such a beautiful symbol for us as a community of believers. We gather around the light of Christ because God is there for us. God takes care of us and God heals us of everything that goes wrong in our lives, everything that is damaged in our life. And that brings me to the watchword, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved. That's from Jeremiah 17 verse 14. So let us celebrate the service in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you are a God who sees all of us and that your salvation encompasses all aspects of our lives. Help us to seek your healing in our lives in all areas, the spiritual, the emotional, our physical health, and also in our relations with one another. We pray for your healing in our lives in all areas. Amen. I invite you to all stand up and we sing together the first song, Praise Him, You Heavens. Praise Him, You Heavens, and all that's about.
heavenly Father for your love for me. I'm forever grateful that you sacrificed your Son. You saved my soul and changed my destiny. Thank you, God, for Jesus in me. I'm so glad that Jesus lives in my house. Good to know that he is here with me now. Let us now continue by praying the psalm, Psalm 32, verse 1 to 7. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. everyone hear me? Okay. The epistle reading is taken from James 5, chapter 13 to 16. You can find this in your pew Bibles on page 274. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, for confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Here ends the reading. Hallelujah. Gospel reading is taken from Mark 2, chapter 1 to 12. You may find this in the New Testament um, on page 41. Glory be to you, O Lord. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, saying to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, Take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of all of them. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let us stand and respond to that with the words of the Apostles' Creed as we proclaim our faith with all Christians on earth. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Imagine for a moment that a good friend of yours has an incurable disability. She's unable to work, really struggles just to perform the daily tasks to stay alive. Washing, cooking, even going to the bathroom, those daily things that we take for granted are almost an impossible obstacle to her. She has tried every treatment that the doctors can think of, but nothing has helped. On many of these doctor's visits, you have accompanied her, and you've noticed how she became more and more despondent. And when the doctor said to her, there is nothing more we can do, she just nods quietly. She had lost hope long before that anyway. A while later, you hear about a remarkable new treatment that has helped others with similar problems to your friend. The only problem is, the only doctor in South Africa who does this new treatment is down in Cape Town. Your friend doesn't think it's worth the effort. She's been disappointed so often before. What do you do? You care so much for this friend of yours and really want to see her get all the help that she can get. 
The sermon text, which you've already heard as a gospel reading, is about a very similar situation. A man who was paralyzed had also lost all hope of being healed, but at least he had some good friends who would stop at nothing to get help for him. We pick up the story in the town of Capernaum, and word had gotten around that the famous miracle worker had just arrived back from some time out in the wilderness. And you heard how that story unfolded just now in the Gospel reading. By this time, Jesus had become quite well known in the area. He had hardly returned to Capernaum, and the people were already flocking around him again. He didn't even have privacy in the house where he was staying at. They had realized that he was somehow different. That he somehow had something that was missing in their lives. He had done some miraculous healings and had also showed the demons who was boss. But also, he had a message to bring. Which he spoke about time and time again. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Turn away from what is wrong and believe in the good news. That was his message. And while he was still telling the people about the kingdom of God, suddenly there is a commotion outside. Those standing near the door or outside could see what was going on. Four men bringing a paralyzed man, carrying him on a sleeping mat. But inside the house, Jesus continued preaching, and the people listened intently, so they didn't even realize what was happening. The men quickly realized that there was no chance of getting their friend to Jesus through the door. The house was so full of people, there were so many more standing in front of the door, that this was simply not an option. So, they had to come up with another plan. Now, the houses they had in those days had a flat roof made of thatch and a layer of clay on top. And they often had stairs going up the outside that you could get on top of the roof. In the climate there, that was quite useful because it got quite hot during the day and you'd look for the evening cool on the top of your roof during the hot months. Look, said one of them, those stairs on the side of the house, they are wide enough that we can bring our friend up to the roof. And what then? Another replied. We simply make a hole in the roof and let him down in front of Jesus. This was easier said than done. First they had to organize some sharp sticks and some shovels to make the hole. Then they need, needed some rope to tie to the ends of the sleeping mat to let their friend down. After some minutes, they had gathered all the tools they needed and started pushing their way through the crowd. It took quite some effort to get to the top of the roof, but after a while, they managed to do that and also to make the hole. After some loud protests from the people inside the house, I mean, imagine, put yourself in that situation, suddenly there's bits of clay and bits of thatch and sticks raining down on your head, uh, yeah, I don't know how pleasant that would have been. Um, but at any rate, the people kept going. What does Jesus do? Does he shout at them? Or does he simply ignore it and go on preaching? Does he get annoyed for being interrupted? Or that the house of his hosts where he's staying is being demolished? None of those. He recognized the faith of the men who brought their friend to him. And he was willing to honor this faith. Let's take note of that for a moment. Jesus recognizes the selfless faith of these men that bring their friend. These days, we hear a lot about the need to have faith. On every street corner, every second billboard, we are promised miracles, if we have enough faith. But notice the difference. 
Often these days, the angle is, you must have faith for yourself. I would call that selfish faith. But these friends of this man had selfless faith. They brought their friend to Jesus. So Jesus interrupts his sermon, speaks to the man and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. We are not told what the paralyzed man or the friend was expecting, or what the paralyzed man or his friends were expecting Jesus to say, but that must have thrown them out a bit. What did Jesus mean by this? Was this a particularly sinful man? Or was the paralysis the result of sin? Mark doesn't say anything about it. Now in John's Gospel, on another occasion where Jesus heals a blind man, there is actually a discussion between Jesus and the disciples about this exact question. Is this man blind because of his own sin or because of the sins of his parents was the question that the disciples asked Jesus. And in the Jewish understanding of the time, sickness or disability was seen as a, resu uh, as a result of somebody's sin. Sickness and disability was seen as that. Even as a direct punishment in some cases. And when we read in the Old Testament, we hear that the Jews understood it that God punishes the sins of the forefathers to the fourth generation even. That he blesses to the thousandth generation. That is often not mentioned even though it's in exactly the same verse. Mark didn't write down any discussion on this, but I would imagine that he would have understood maybe you know, he, w he would have seen it in a similar way to the way that John wrote it down. So what did Jesus mean then when he says, I forgive your sins? When obviously this man came to be healed of his paralysis. I would say it's got something to do with the fact that Jesus has the whole person in mind when he's dealing with us. And he says, yes, I see your paralysis, and yes, we'll deal with that. But we also need to deal with something else. We also need to deal with your separation from God. So when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, he doesn't say, your physical ailment is nothing to be concerned about, and I'm going to ignore that. He just says, I need to deal with you as a whole person and maybe that is something else or something even more fundamental that we need to deal with. The separation from God, the sin that separates you from God. And I think we quite quickly realize that um, because we are living in a world that is full of sin, that we are all affected by sin. Whether it is something that we do ourselves that hurts us, whether it is something we do ourselves that hurts someone else, or whether it is something that someone else does that hurts us, we are all stuck in that system where we are under the influence of sin. And in the end, the issue of who committed a particular sin doesn't really make such a big deal anymore because everyone's suffering. And Jesus says, I've come for all of that, for all of you, to deal with all the brokenness, all the suffering, all the sickness, all the damage to the environment, all the damage that humans are causing to each other in their relationships day after day. And until Jesus deals with our sin, we cannot get out of that system. And so we really can't be fully part of the kingdom of God. At this point, Mark shifts our attention from the paralytic man to a certain group that was part of the crowd. 
Most of the people in the crowd were there because they wanted to see the miracles that were going to happen. And they wanted to hear more about the kingdom of God. But not everyone was so excited about Jesus. The scribes, the Pharisees, they actually were there to check up on Jesus. And they had a very particular understanding of the law. And when Jesus went around saying, I forgive your sins, they were not all too pleased because they understood it as these are the laws we need to keep and they even built fences around the original laws to make more laws, more laws, more laws, layers of laws that the people had to keep. And only then would God accept them was their understanding. And Jesus goes around forgiving sins and the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees said, but only God can go around saying, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus asks the question, what is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Now what would you say? What is the easier thing to say? Your sins are forgiven, in many ways, is easier because there doesn't need to be any proof of that right there right now anybody can say that but is it really true at that moment when you say your sins are forgiven and that was of course what the scribes and the pharisees had in the back of their head but jesus says well yes sure if you just go around saying that that doesn't mean much but let me show you that I have the authority to forgive sins. And then he turned to the man again and said, take your mat and walk. And the man walked. And so, in that moment, you could see that Jesus actually had the authority to do both. The fact that the man could walk showed that Jesus had the authority to heal. And the fact that he was able to heal showed also that he was the Messiah, the healer, the one who came from God, who was God in fact, and therefore had the power, the authority to forgive sins. Now the scribes, they were definitely not all that impressed with him and they were obviously looking for ways to stop him. Because there was another little fine hint that Jesus was giving when he calls himself the Son of Man, which he does here. When he calls himself the Son of Man, most of the people that were there wouldn't really know what he was talking about. But the scribes and the Pharisees, they knew exactly. Because in the Old Testament and even in some other books that were around, um, that term was only used for the Messiah. So Jesus was quite clearly saying, he wasn't making a secret of it to those who knew, he was quite clearly saying, I am the one that you've been waiting for. Come to me. So at the end of the sermon, I want to just highlight two things. First of all, yes, we are here because we at some stage in our lives started following this call of Jesus because we recognized him as the Messiah. But even more so, think of that paralyzed man who had lost all hope, but his friends brought him to Jesus. So that is our challenge, our invitation. We followed that call at some stage to follow Jesus, and we are invited to invite our friends because we have experienced something with Jesus and our friends can experience that too. So let us invite our friends to Jesus in whatever way that may happen, whether it is by speaking to them, whether it is by praying over them, whether it is by inviting them to join this fellowship of believers, those of us in that sculpture, that are looking to Jesus, the light of the world, who is also our healer.
I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. Here in the grace of God I stand. My heart is overflowing, my love just keeps on growing. Here in the grace of God I stand. And I will praise you, Lord, yes, I will praise you, Lord, and I will sing of all that you have done. The joy that knows the limit, the lightness in my spirit, here in the grace of God I stand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who heals us in every aspect of our lives. We thank you that we can come to you with our broken bodies, our broken hearts, our broken feelings, our broken relationships, and everything else that needs healing in our lives. We thank you that we can entrust those that we love to you as well. And we pray, as we pray in silence now, we think of those specifically who we would like to lift up to you. Lord, we also especially want to lift up the different conflict areas in our country and in the world right now. We think specifically of the situation that is, that is developed there in Senegal. We pray that somehow you break through in that setting that people can somehow find a way to reconcile with each other. We pray for the various areas in the world where massive conflict and full-out war is actually still happening on a daily basis. We pray that also there solutions may be found and that your light may break through there. Lord, we pray for your blessing over those who are writing exams at the moment, matrics and students. Be with them, give them clarity of mind, help them to focus in their studies, help them to manage their time well, that they may, may be able to do these exams under the difficult circumstances as they are right now to the best of their ability. And whatever we else still have on our mind right now, we put into the words that you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We will now have some announcements, and after that I will say the blessing. Good morning and welcome back. So good to see you, so good to be here. And for everyone who's listening from home, I hope that your coffee is still warm because you were so wrapped up in the service that you participated at home. So uh, this morning there are a few announcements. Um, first of all, um, the offering that we aren't taking up in the pews so that we don't hand out the basket will be at the exit. There's a basket on the last pew, so you're welcome to um, put your offering in there. Today it is for the mission fund, so that um, is a fund where all the churches contribute into to um, be able to finance some missions projects that are happening within our wider denomination. If you're at home and you'd like to contribute, you can do an EFT and just mark it specifically um, for the mission fund or for offering. Volta has that under full control and allocates all the givings to the right areas. On the area of finance, I would like to thank all of you here and at home for the amazing giving that has taken place over the last seven months when we haven't seen each other face to face. It has been a huge burden that has been taken off my shoulders and also of the whole Congregational Council. It was one thing we did not have to worry about um, in this time. And to me that is huge, and if I could give you a round of applause, <laughs> I would do so, so to yourself. <laughs> it really um, has been for me um, an amazing sign of how faithful this congregation is, that we can go for months on end and where it's not even a question whether I continue to support the congregation so that pastor can get his salary, that Mpo and Vuma and Tami can get their salaries in this really difficult time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the care group has had support. We've been able to increase our food parcels for those who really had a need in this time. Um, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Doesn't mean you have to stop giving, but we've managed through these months, and I just want to say a heartfelt thank you. I don't think that we should take this for granted. And that's that. And normally, in a few weeks, um, our bazaar would be coming up. We have decided as Congregational Council not to hold it as an in-person live event here, but we will try to um, have some things like the Advents Wreath maybe advertised online so that people can pre-order and that we will make them and make a plan to get it to the people. So keep your eyes out for that. But just so you know that um, we won't have um, in-house bazaar here this year. Then um, Zulu Bibles. Apparently there's an exciting new translation that has come out. I understand from what I'm being told that it's literally just new, um, <clears throat> new modern Zulu. So it's almost like an old King James version to something that people understand today. And if you would be interested to have one of those new translation Bibles, they're 129 rand each, and you can inform the office or Pastor Martin so that we can do one order for everyone who would like. But otherwise, what is it, the Bible Society? That this, otherwise, you can obviously also contact the Bible Society directly, but if anyone in the congregation would like one, um, contact the office, and we can do one, one big order. Can is I just correct? maybe add something to that? And that is, um, there are also fancier versions if you want uh, a, a gold cut leather bound one. Um, please have a look on the Bible Society's websites. Uh, uh, then you can, you can see there what the, uh, what the options are and just let us know and we will order that, that one then as, as if, you, if you prefer something really fancy as a gift or something like that to someone. Perfect. In my head, those were all the announcements I can think of, but I would like to say thank you to the person sitting behind there, behind that video camera at um, Congregational Council. Every month we said it's amazing the work that Liesl has put into all this work. So now that I can say to you face to face, I would like to do so. I think it's been a very long stretch and unfortunately for you the stretch hasn't quite ended yet. So thank you. Heartfelt thank you to Liesl and if you can please clap properly. Loud. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> okay. And also to our musicians, to Brenda and to Zonia and Pastor Martin, who's now everything. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for all your efforts. Please stand for the blessing. And we may not be able to hold hands, but we can certainly connect with each other by looking at each other. And as we speak the, the blessing together, um, let us, yeah, if you, if you would like to join in, if you know the words... 
And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated for a little prelude, a postlude, sorry. <laughs> there we go.